dollars to donuts with your host, Steve Portugal. Greetings, humans. Thanks for listening to Dollars to Donuts, the podcast where I talk to people who lead user research in their organization. Over the past while, I've been putting together a household emergency kit. It's primarily a shopping exercise, and I've ordered a hand crank and solar-powered radio, a replacement for matches, latex gloves, bandages, and air filter masks which we made use of during a period of dangerously poor air quality recently. The last step was getting some food that will last. Cans of soup and stew, crackers, single-serve breakfast cereals. There's something satisfying about acquiring a bunch of stuff and storing it away somewhat organized. And that led to a stray thought that I noticed. Oh, I can't wait to use all this great stuff. And then I realized how crazy that sounded. I don't want to use it. I don't want there to be some emergency that is bad enough that I'm drinking the emergency water stored in the garage and eating canned stew also stored in the garage. I mean, yes, we'll eat or donate the food before it expires and replace it. But this has overall been a whole set of preparations that I hope I'll not use, which leaves me with the hope for no shopping gratification, which is kind of a confusing way to feel. But it did remind me of the recent workshop I led with researchers in Sydney, Australia. We looked at a lot of the user research war stories I've been collecting, like those published in Doorbells, Danger, and Dead Batteries, and we pulled out lessons and best practices. There was, as there always is, a lot of discussion about safety and preparation. It seemed to me that people who worked in organizations with established safety cultures already had a strong baseline of safety procedures for user research and field work, like, for example, texting a contact before and after a session not going out alone, and so on. Their work cultures were strong on processes, especially for safety. So thinking about this for research was obvious, but not everyone works in that kind of environment, and plenty of researchers work for themselves without that corporate structure to support them in creating best practices for safety. Anyway, it led to a lot of discussion beyond just safety about running through possibilities ahead of time so that when any situation comes up, it's not a surprise, and there's at least a starting point already established about how to respond. I think this is a great idea, but I think we have to acknowledge the limitations. You can't plan for every possible situation. There are always going to be things that come up that you probably haven't ever considered. I think that some planning for the unexpected will help you to adapt in the moment to surprises, but that's different from the false comfort of assuming you have every contingency planned for. I hope I never have to make use of our large cache of sterile latex gloves, but maybe just having acquired them, I'm in a slightly better situation for some other unexpected situation. You can help me continue to produce this podcast for you. I run my own small business, and you can hire me. I lead in-depth user research that helps drive product and strategy decisions, that helps drive internal change. I provide guidance to teams while they are learning about their customers, and I deliver training that teaches people how to be better at user research and analysis. You can buy either of my two books, The Classic Interviewing Users and Doorbells, Danger, and Dead Batteries, a book of stories from other researchers about the kinds of things that happen when they go out into the field. You can also review this podcast on iTunes and review the books on Amazon. With your support, I can keep doing this podcast for you. All right, time for my interview with Tomer. Tomer Sharon is the head of user research and metrics at Goldman Sachs. He's worked at Google and WeWork and he's written two books, It's Our Research and Validating Product Ideas Through Lean User Research. Well, thanks for being on the podcast. It's great to have you here, virtually here in audio space that we're all sharing. Yeah, why don't you start off with just do a little introduction. Who are you? Where do you work? What are you doing? Okay, thank you for having me first. Um, My name is Thomas Sharon. I am currently head of user research and metrics at Goldman Sachs. I do have a second uh, day job. I'm also heading a design group uh, for a product called PWM, Private Wealth Management. Yeah, this is where I'm at in the past, uh, well... Almost a year. All right. So, what is what is Goldman Sachs? Goldman Sachs is, uh, I would say, an investment bank. Probably one of the more uh, important banks in the world. Big corporate. Definitely not one you would associate with design and research. Uh, at least not that type of research. But they're changing, and uh, they're celebrating 150 years uh, this year. And they're moving towards uh, what's called outside digital transformation. And that includes learning more from their audiences and doing investing a lot more in design. 
What's the relationship between the existence of your role and this larger shift that's going on? I think I think there's a strong relationship. They they have been realizing that they can't just be living in their own box and they have to open up and uh, try and understand audiences that they're engaged with already and on your new audiences. So I'll give an example. Uh, Goldman has a, a commercial bank. It's called Marcus. It's been around for a couple of years, but still these are consumers that Goldman is now uh, trying to attract. So it's definitely not, not the kind of typical audience that they're used to. So they understand that they need to open up learn from them and design for them and with them. And that is a shift that has been happening in the past few years. And uh, my role, I, I didn't replace anyone. I'm, I'm the, the first one, uh, is, is a part of that shift. Is there any sort of one point or one incident or key moment, I guess, which sort of marks that transition in a company like Goldman to say, yeah, we've, we've been doing it this way. We need to do it this way. I think it happened in, a, I don't know if there's one event, but I think it happened in the past, maybe two years user experience team there was very small. And then suddenly they decided that it's time to to invest more in that. And from zero, it went to, I don't know, several dozens, many dozens within a year. And the more do their work, show their work, share their work, and their work is very successful, the more teams and, and leaders talk about that. And then it's like a cycle that feeds itself and then it grows and grows. So uh, that's been happening a lot in the past few years. And do you have a perspective on I mean, because the, the, this awareness that you're describing at Goldman seems to align with what I've heard and observed in financial services in general. Okay. That it's an industry that maybe wasn't seen as paying attention to consumers, users, design, and over the past number of years. Yeah. You know. I will admit this is my first financial services job, so I'm not really familiar with that with that world yeah. uh, other than Goldman. Uh, but so I hear. So I, I, I don't really know from, from first experience. But I'm, in, I'm inferring, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm inferring that, that that also is not a conversation that you're having inside Goldman. No, no, it's very, I would say, kind of practical and, and tactical. We're not talking about the concept of having me and people like me there. We're just, you know, focusing on doing the doing the work that that we know how to do. We've been doing for many years, and just bringing that, you know, insight and understanding of that world to an organization that wasn't aware of that previously. I mean, that world is the process and tools of, of learning about um, people. Yeah, I would say process, tools, people. They're used to hiring different people. Uh, I, I saw that in I saw that in Google at the time. I saw that at WeWork at the time, uh, where even formally you don't have in the I don't know HR systems you don't have names for for roles for what we do for who we are. So so we're I can't remember the the names, but we were I don't know engineers or UI engineers or things like that until you get recognized. And I, I experienced that at Google, and then and then you do have a job family for design and for research and and so on. So. So at Goldman, you're trying to then like, that's part of the... Well, the I'm, I'm not, you know, we're, we're too, especially in research, we're too few people to start having a, a job family in, in, the, in, a, in the HR systems, but we'll get there. I mean, I think uh, what I'm trying to do is first uh, a lot of evangelism, a lot of conversations with people to plant seeds in their minds that they might need somebody like that, that they might engage in a project, a one-off project and, and, and learn more about it. It. And with several groups and divisions, it, it works already. So we have people there and they start doing their, their work. Uh, it's interesting that you're sort of highlighting evangelism versus like conducting research. Right, right. Um, Sometimes it's it's uh, integrated. Yeah. Sometimes there's kind of, I'm, I'm asking people to kind of some kind of a leap of faith. And then we actually, we do the research and then the work talks for itself. I don't, I don't need to evangelize anymore. They, they get it. They understand. They want more of it. And from there, it's the, the doors are open. I prefer it this way, even in the past. I, I prefer to kind of do the work show rather than kind of wave my hands and talk about it. I, always, I, always, I found it to always be more uh, meaningful to people and more persuading. Does, I've heard this. I don't know if this is what's playing out for you in these situations. But that, yeah, you know, you help someone take a leap of faith. You do this work. It, the results speak for themselves yep. for them. Do those results, you know, or, or how can you help those results spread elsewhere in the organization? I, I use that example when I talk with others. Yeah. 
uh, and I invite people to connect. I mean, same company, you can hear from them, can meet them. I sometimes facilitate those meetings and then they hear from others. I know it will take time. That's not something that happens, you know, over a day or a week or a month, sometimes a year. But these conversations happen, uh, whether I'm aware of them or not, whether I facilitate them or not. And I'm, I'm, I'm confident that the more work we do, the more people will have and, and will be more kind of impactful. And how does that work across different, I don't know if they're called business units, but you, Goldman, as you said, sort of speaks to different kinds of users, different kinds of customers yeah. with its products and services. So as soon as we have a researcher joining uh, the group, we assign them to a, let's call it a business unit uh, or a product team. Uh, and then they're theirs 100% of the time. I only support them with um, kind of infrastructure, career growth and, and things like that. And then they do their work with the, with the team. I do a lot of legwork kind of before that happens to make sure that they have a team that wants them, that needs them, and that knows what to expect. Uh, so it's not the first time that they hear about, uh, you know, the, that research thing with, with the appearance of the person. Yeah, so that's, that's how I intend to kind of continue yeah. doing rather than kind of uh, hire to uh, like a work in an agency model, have a pool of people yeah. that come and go uh, kind of based on projects. Okay, so just to, to reiterate, you're, you talk about help someone to take a leap of faith. Yeah. And maybe I'm putting those words, I'm no, no. maybe changing your words a little bit, but, and a next step from that is to hire someone and put them in that team. Yeah. And then they do the work, and then the work, as you said, the work speaks for itself, but it's yeah. the work that you've staffed someone into that team. Yeah. I'll just add to that that in many cases, it's not really a leap of faith because there are people who are, and I call myself an outsider, uh, who didn't grow up in, in Goldman that know about this field, know about research, know about people like us. So they're very open to having them. So uh, yeah. that, that's, that's easy, much easier. So you said that you're, you know, you're, you're not looking to do an agency model. No. From your face, I think there's a point of view. Yes, definitely. Uh, what's the point of view behind The point that? of view is that I want people to feel they belong. Researchers feel they belong to a team. And I, I, I feel that if, if I just you know, send them off to projects, short-term projects, they can't grow with the team. They can't have any history with the product. They're not familiar. They're really like... Uh, consultants that come and go. I want them to feel a part of the team, understand all the history, sit with them. I, I don't look for them to sit next to me. I want them to sit with their teams and then, uh, you know, kind of be a part of that team and then and then be uh, more impactful. I, I strongly believe that this is the way to go. Yeah. yeah. And I've seen that. I've seen that happen before, kind of with my own my own eyes, both uh, not not we work because we didn't do that at we work, but uh, definitely at Google, uh, where we experienced at some point a decentralization. So there was one UX group and then we're decentralized into the different business units. Not much has changed because people were assigned to teams uh, already, but it just felt like the right thing to do to have people sit with their teams, work with their with the same team, the same product for long periods of time. So, what implications of any does that have for what kind of skill set someone that you're hiring needs to have? Yeah, that's a good one. So, I'm looking for more experienced people, uh, more senior people. Uh, there will be a time where we will hire more junior people. That's not the time when we're just starting. Uh, and I had the same thing uh, at WeWork when we were building a group from, from scratch. Um, you need experienced people. So I'm looking for people who are eager and passionate about building something uh, from scratch, taking a team that maybe doesn't know anything about user research and try and kind of build that relationship and build those results. You talked about that earlier with that team and grow with them, grow the practice with them. And maybe uh, if it's extremely successful, grow a team there at some point. There's always a thing with questions and answers where you, for, at least for me, I ask a question. I have an idea of what answer I'm going to get. Okay. Um, and it's interesting when the answer is different. <laughs> I know it doesn't always cleave this way, but there's sort of the soft skills and hard skills thing. Yeah. I, I imagined I was going to get a hard skills answer because I was thinking about some of the pragmatic constraints of this. But you gave no. your answer <laughs> emphasized more, I think, softer skills, uh, you know, growth, yeah. advocacy, leadership from a research point of view. I think it kind of almost goes without saying that once you're, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but once you're, I always like to, I, I tell that to my people uh, when we hire, we look for resumes that scream researcher. So if your resume screams researcher, 
then that's that that's covered. I'm 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 more more interested in the soft skills. Yeah. Can I push on that just a little bit more? Sure. I mean, I think uh and you know, I mean, I'll just my bias here or my the, the perspective I come from is the consultants, right? So yeah. I come in and out. Uh so I know what the limitations of that are um and I and so just from my from where I sit, I see the challenges of what you're describing because I mean, there's a life cycle of what a team is developing probably a smarter way to say that, but something's being built and it goes through yep. stages over weeks, months, years. Uh, and so the research needs change. Right. And so the way the researcher has to respond to that or lead that or support that changes. Right. So that's, so that's kind of the, that's, that's, I'm just revealing what I was probing on here or what I, th- I thought the answer was going to be. When you say screams a researcher in a resume, <laughs> uh, does that sort of imply that, you know, the ability to are you inferring from that that resume the ability to support that team at all these different eras of its evolution? Yeah, a resume that screams researcher is a resume that you know you see all you see all the methods, you see the flexibility in, in kind of uh, not sticking to one method or yeah. one approach. Doing that in multiple cultures, multiple companies have a trajectory of growth. Yeah. So you're doing from kind of less meaningful things to more meaningful things, and so on. So yeah, that's to me screams researcher. Got it. <laughs> Not, you know, you look at the job titles and you ask yourself, why am I even reading this resume? And then you, you read a cover letter that says something along the lines of, I've always wanted to be. I think I'm, that's, I mean, maybe at some point, but not now. Yes, right. There is an archetype of a person, I think, that identifies strongly with researchers yeah. and sort of what what they're about, but yeah. their experience doesn't match that. And I'm smiling because I, I there's always an exception. Um and I, I remember one at WeWork where and I was just, I was talking, you know, speaking the same way. Only senior people, I'm not looking for more junior people. And then I hired two junior people because there's always an exception because you see some somebody who kinda ig- makes me ignore everything I just said and yeah. hire them. So. What's an example of something that, that overrides that? I, I don't even know how to explain it. It's just uh, sometimes it's a spark in the eyes yeah. <laughs> that you see immediately with people and you see that they are going to be like a sponge, if that's a good metaphor. Mm-hmm. Um, and you just, you just know it's going to work. Right. You said passion early yeah. on, yeah. right? Yeah. And I yeah. think, uh, I don't know, evidence of passion is past performance, but that's not the only... Right. Evidence of passion. If you're seeing that with people right. that you're meeting, right. although in most cases I'm kind of I'm very reluctant to uh, hire based on passion if you don't have experience. Yeah, because you can have a lot of passion and motivation, but you know nothing, and that it doesn't mean you're going to be bad, but it means a lot of people are going to need to support you. Um, so I think my my kind of my approach is that I'll try and do zero to very little of that because we're just starting. We're yeah. just a few people. We don't really have the time that we need to support our teams. We don't have the time to support another person. Um, not now. When we grow, yeah, that's that's definitely. There's, you know, if we were, I don't know, 10, 20 senior people on the team, I would say we have to have junior more junior people because we can't have a team of only senior people. Right. Uh, but right now we're not even close to that. So, um can you say the size that you are now? Yeah, sure. I mean, we are four, a couple of weeks will be five. So worldwide, both in here in New York and in London. And is there a, like a roadmap for number of people, you know, to get to that um, 10 or 20? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't want to mention numbers, but I think we're, um, we're on a path of growth. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you talk about sort of the, the time commitment required to support people, different levels. Yeah. Uh, but you, so I, I want to go back and clarify one thing. Mm-hmm. You sort of, was almost an aside. You said that uh, you don't want to do the agency model. You want people with these teams, but yeah. you're trying to provide uh, infrastructure. Yes. And then you used a phrase like career growth. Yeah. So at given the size that you're at now, like acknowledging that there's bandwidth, you know, challenges here. But so, what does infrastructure look like? What does uh, career growth look like now? Infrastructure. So, so that's that's easy. Uh, so, there's a lot of uh, when I look around me, I, there's a lot of motivation to do research, but there are there are needs in terms of and, and gaps in terms of tools, knowledge, guidance, process. So, research was happening before there were researchers, but it was kind of very kind of based on sporadic motivation from different people uh, who are tr- really trying to do the best they could do. Uh, so we need to support them with, you know, 
services that are out there, industry standard services. So we need to sign agreements and and get those licenses on board different vendors. What's the uh, example? Uh, user testing, user Zoom. These would be two, uh, but there are more. And um, we are kind of creating process for, okay, what happens if you want to do research, but you don't have a researcher and you probably won't have a researcher in the next few years. But you still, you 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 acknowledge the fact that you need research now. So we have some, some we've established some kind of a, a, a you know, a way to uh, ask for that and then sign up for office hours or something like that and then get some help from us. We will advise you and help you kind of get going uh, without a researcher. We're working with, uh, started working with OKRs. So if that's, that's to me, that's a part of kind of infrastructure or the cool kids now call it research ops. So research ops. Right. Um, so wait, so explain what OKRs are. Explain what research ops is. <laughs> OKR is objectives and key results. It's a goal setting approach. Uh, there are many. This is just the one that I'm uh, used to, familiar with. And that's just a way to set goals and, and see how you're, how you're doing. So we do that as a, as a research group uh, as well. Research ops, I would take the easy road and say this is everything that helps research happen without the actual research. So is the, are the OKRs an example of research yeah. ops? That's what you're saying? So the, the, the tools that I mentioned, yeah. the OKRs, hiring, uh, knowledge management. We All want, of the infrastructure know, yes. is... Yeah. If somebody wants to do, uh, I don't know, whatever, a usability test, and they don't know how. So you want them to have the tool. We want them to have a knowledge base that they can access and see, okay, what do I need to do to, to run a usability test? And we want them to have uh, guidance and support from a person, from a, from a researcher who knows what they're doing. And I, w- I would say all of that is research ops. For researchers, a uh, big part of research ops is uh, participant recruitment. So finding people to learn from, um, that's a big part. And something that I'm truly passionate about is uh, kind of re- insight repository. So building some kind of a repository that we can pull from uh, later on. I would add to that any infrastructure involving measuring the user experience. Uh, So building that, uh, I would also include that under research ops. Uh, So you said you're passionate about uh, Insight repository. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, I have to actually ask a question. What do you want to know? Um, (laughs) Yeah, what's, uh, how is... What are you trying to get to at Goldman? What's what are you working towards with that? It's the same as as everywhere. I mean, I for ma- many years I realized I was kind of bothered by how wasteful research is. That even I felt that I'm kind of quote unquote learning the same things over and over again. I know that other people did research in the same company did research that I'm about to do. And even if I get their insights, I'm going to do that again. And I know it's really, really messy and hard to uh, retain all the knowledge that uh, that you gather from from research. So I, I, I was, you know, the second I had an opportunity to do something about it, I did. That was at WeWork. And we built a system that we called Polaris for that, to solve these problems. We identified the... It's going to sound funny, but we identify that the, the main problem, the main root cause for these problems are, or is the, the research report. That was what I, what I called back then the, uh, the atomic unit of a research insight. And we changed that unit into, well, that's why the metaphor breaks, a smaller atom that we call a nugget, a research nugget. Uh, and that's what we stored in, those, in this uh, repository. So a nugget was a combination of an observation, evidence, and Tags. What was the last one? I'm sorry. Tags. And then uh, due to these tags, you can then search through uh, this database and find answers to questions that you didn't design studies around. So uh, it happened many times at WeWork where people came to us and said, what do we know about how or can we do a study about blah, blah. And we said, uh, let's, let's try Polaris first. And we realized that we have all the answers without even needing to do more research. This will only happen, uh, you have to change your ways a little bit, not just work with a system like that. This will only happen if you do kind of continuous research, continuous and open-ended research. Back then at WeWork, we did uh, uh, exit interviews. So every WeWork member, customer that decided to leave, we uh, 
ping them and talk with them, interview them, and ask them kind of very open-ended questions such as, you know, why are you leaving? What worked well at WeWork? What didn't work so well? Uh, if you had 15 minutes with the CEO, what would you tell him? Things like that. And then that allowed us to have answers to many, many questions because these research participants, these exiting members, uh, decided what they wanted to talk about. If they wanted to talk about, I don't know, whatever, the price that was too high for them or the coffee that was too great for them to leave to another place or whatever it is that they chose uh, went went you know went uh, into the system and then we could uh, pull it out later on and then see okay we heard and combining with with combining that with a user experience measurement system would lead you to a situation where you can say okay I saw that satisfaction with coffee in our WeWork buildings in the Netherlands has gone down in the past month here is a playlist of three Dutch members bitch about coffee from the past month. And then you have the what happened, the numbers. You have the why it happened from the, these videos. Um, and if you kind of quote unquote serve that to the person that buys or decides how to brew coffee in the Netherlands, then it's halfway through to the solution. So we imagine something like that at Goldman as well. So it only works, you said, if you have kind of ongoing... Yeah. Open-ended Have to. research. Yeah. Why? Why is that? Because if you, if you always so the other type of research I, I had to give it a name. So I would call it a dedicated research. Dedicated research is research that you do and you know what research questions you have beforehand uh, and you answer those questions and then you can you can create nuggets and it's all good. But then you'll only have answers to those questions uh, when you do open-ended you have answers to questions you never imagined that you might have or may have in the future. What if my research question is, what are the highs and lows of a WeWork member? Is that... So if you do that once, you'll get a snapshot of, yes. of that point in time. Okay. But if you do that continuously, kind of all the time, and as we work, we, we at some point interviewed all the UX team members did that on a kind of regular frequency, then you have thousands and thousands of, of data points. Uh, that you can okay, so on. there's a sort of a scale here. Yeah, scope or scale. I don't even know which one it is, but there's there's a there's an amount of data. Yeah. Uh, that covers a breadth of topics, uh, and that is also refreshed. Yeah. Okay. So what's uh, I would hate if anyone asked me this question, but I'm going <laughs> to ask you what's what's an insight? Because you were kind of saying a nugget oh, is this I, sort of I, stuff, uh, but you you brought up insight. So what's an insight? Yeah, I actually have a definition for that. I'm thinking about that these days. Uh, an insight to me is a deep understanding of a situation. Um, so you, I'm trying to think of an example. I'll, I'll, I'll go to I'll go to WeWork again. So imagine a researcher that walks in a WeWork building, kind of looking around, and then sees WeWork has a, a kind of shared open spaces, but also private offices. So let's say they notice in private offices that a lot of them have printers that they brought in, and that looks odd because WeWork offers printing. So we have printers and we offer that as a part of as a part of your, your WeWork membership and, and if you kinda go over you you pay for more. It's a n nice stream of, of revenue for uh, WeWork and when and they counted, let's say they counted and saw that half of the private offices brought in their own printers. They walk they go to a second building and a third building and they count and they see the same. Half half of the of the members that are that have private offices brought in their uh, their own printer. So let's say they stop here, go back to the office and add an insight nugget, whatever we call it, to the system saying half of WeWork members in those buildings brought in their own printers. That to me is not a deep understanding of the situation. Uh, that's not enough. It's very interesting. It may be indicative of a something that's going on that we're not aware of, but that's not enough. We have to understand why. So I would encourage that researcher to knock on the doors and ask, why? And then we may hear things like, oh, you know, you have a 15-page manual on how to install uh, printers, and it's, it's, that's, that's, I'm not going to waste my time on that. Or you have to log in each time you go to a printer, and that, that's, that's taking more time, uh, and so on and so forth. We do steal your paper, so it's, uh, we enjoy that. So w that's what I mean by deeper understanding. So yeah. we can better understand the situation, know to answer why that is happening, have some evidence, and then then I would say that's an insight. That's a deep understanding of a situation. And to me, the system that we built kind of 
enforce that. So you cannot submit nuggets or insights without that why part. Just facts are not, are not enough. We don't need facts. We need facts plus why they are what they are. Right. There's a behavior. What's the reason yeah. for that behavior? Yeah. Uh, and I, I struggle when I hear people talk about insights because sometimes they talk about why a single person is doing something as opposed to sort of why users of a system are experiencing something. Like in your scenario, you knock on somebody's door and say, uh, you know, what's what's up with your own printer? And they say, oh yeah, it's it's, uh, it's too hard to install. Yeah. And you come back and say, like, there's a difference between uh, we understand why this person was doing it and then sort of the the generalized conclusion. I don't know, I'm putting my own language into your framework. It's probably not That's working. Right. But what, what we would do with Polaris is gather those individual insights. So each one would be a nugget. Yeah. And then if you have a hundred of these, the only difference would be the video, the person in front of the camera explaining why, why they brought in... Uh, uh, a printer or whatever it is. And then you can create a playlist and show it to IT or whoever decided that we're going to go with this system for printing and have them decide what they're going to do about it. Okay, so let me push on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, because when you talk to, let's just say, five people or something about this mm-hmm. this behavior, bringing in their own printers, people are going to give related but sort of seemingly individualized explanations. Mm-hmm. And there's an act of interpretation, analysis, and synthesis words that we often yep. use to sort of say, well, let's look at all of those. Like, what's the overarching reason? Yep. You know, talk about a deep understanding. And it's not that we lose track of the fact that the installation manuals is, is messy. There's not enough plugs. There's a lot of sort of reasons, but the larger issue is something like complexity or not seen as adding to my business or something. There's there's a higher order thing. To me, that's what the insight is. And, and, and um, yeah, so I think you were talking about doing that. I'm just, yeah. uh, uh, the words are slippery here when we're talking about yeah. insights and nuggets and sort of explanations. Nugget is more the kind of the technical uh, way we call it, but uh, I agree. Uh, and the way it happened uh, in Polaris is through those playlists. So we encourage mm. people, both in, in you know, people who belong to the UX team and ones that are not, to collect these nuggets into playlists and then prove a point or do this analysis, get to an insight uh, and share it. So it depends on what you find and what you collect there. But you let's say you search for printers and then you get 73 results. You sip through them and you see that, you know, uh, 15 are, you know, not really related to what you're trying to uh, to communicate here. The rest is too many. So you'll pick maybe seven that are, uh, the videos are really good, like good participants, quote unquote, good participants that, you know, eloquently explain the point. And then you can add your analysis in, in writing uh, and describe that higher insight or deeper right. insight. Yeah. So, so you, Polaris you kind of sets you up to make that interpretation. Yeah. It gives yeah. you... Some structure, yes. some 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 way to quickly. Yes. Does it? Does Polaris? Uh, you know, you talk. Does Polaris capture that thing that it facilitates you to make? What do you mean? So create this playlist. You watch the playlist, and you come up with sort of a new articulation. The biggest issue around printers for us is that we are doing this, and they are thinking that. Right. That's a that's a new piece of okay. knowledge that's created by reviewing what Polaris gives you. Yeah. Polaris was not smart. It's just a tool. It's just it would do whatever, it allows you to do whatever you want to do with it. So it allows you to add text to to do that. Yeah. Uh, so if, if that's a yes, then yeah, it allowed you to do that. But Polaris in its kind of essence is very simple. Yeah. Um, it's just, just a tool that facilitates the... Um, uh, storage of those nuggets, yeah, and creation of those um, uh, playlists from these. Yeah, oh, so that, that that really helps me understand sort of what you're aiming at with when you talk about insight repository. Yeah. Um, it's to me the something that you can requery to yes. come up with new conclusions, exactly. As opposed to sort of here's all the things that we've concluded. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Wow. Uh, you know, <laughs> here's the here's the gif of yeah. the mind blowing up a little bit. Yeah. You okay. want more? I mean, yeah. if you have more, yes. Now, I mean, these are now it's just ideas, and and that's not something I'm I'm kind of working towards in, in Goldman. But I'm thinking. So imagine every company that should have a Polaris has it. That's also a waste, <laughs> because then every company has its own repository, and then I'm sure there's a lot of overlap. So maybe in the future there should be a kind of 
open panopticon that you know <laughs> an open Polaris or whatever we call it. Yeah. Um that anybody can contribute to and anybody can pull from. I'm not doing anything about that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, a, a friend of mine, so this is like a third hand quote that I'm sure I'm mm-hmm. misquoting, but uh, a friend of mine told me this and he was quoting the uh, like the head of knowledge management at NASA. Okay. And uh, this guy says, uh, the best knowledge management tool is lunch. I can see where, uh, I can see why that was said, yet I wholeheartedly reject the idea. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's not scalable. That's not, what if I went to the bathroom when that happened? What if I started working in NASA a day after that important insight was shared? I can understand the kind of anecdotal uh, part of it, how it's useful. But to me, there has to be something, uh, I don't know what to call it, more solid. Yeah. I mean, analogously, you started off our conversation by describing the the lunching that you're doing at, at Goldman. I mean... Yeah. Connecting people, meeting people. That's that's different, I think, than uh, you know, transmitting nuggets. Yeah. But you are using sort of lunch, and I mean very yeah. vaguely lunch, time with people, talking to them. Yeah. Uh, as a way to I don't know, as a way to do what? What's the what's the difference between sort of the NASA lunch thing and what you're doing with sort of socializing and, and connecting people? I think what what I'm trying to do is kind of socialize a discipline. Yeah. And if I understand it correctly, the NASA lunch is to socialize an insight, maybe. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't think we're there yet in terms of socializing yeah. insights. Uh, and, and who knows yeah. what the context of that quote, yeah. which has been yeah, quoted, yeah, yeah, which yeah. I'm requoting, yeah, yeah. it might be exactly <laughs> coherent with what you're maybe. talking about. Maybe. Can I, I want to loop back to something you talked about as part of this this um, this infrastructure. You know, you said there's groups that don't have a researcher and that yeah. may never have a researcher. Right. And so what are sort of tools, uh, knowledge base that can help them do things? And I feel like that's it's a there's a thing in our field about uh, like who does research. Oh yeah, you know I, I'm not really <laughs> sure what the label for that is, but uh, job security. Yeah, is is that what it is? Should we let them do research? Right. Yeah, I, it makes me laugh. Yeah. Of course, we should let them, <laughs> as if we're the authority. But yeah, of course. I mean, why would anyone not be allowed to do research because they didn't go to school? I, I don't think so. If somebody wants to do it, that's to me, to me, that that's huge. So we should give them everything we can to let them do it. Are they going to be doing a bad job? Maybe. But to me, bad research is, is better than no research. It's a first step. And if we're good about the tools, the, you know, socializing what we do, socializing best practices, things will get better. Yeah, they'll probably be crap at it in the first few times, maybe the first 20 times, but... They really want to. They have this passion and why kill it by saying that it's our job or something like that. So, yes, I'm all for, quote unquote, letting them um, do research. Definitely. I mean, I think you highlighted exactly. So there's I think job security is a fear, uh, but I think bad research is also a fear, as you said. Um, I'm I'm okay with that. And you said bad research is better than no research. To me, yeah, 100%. Yes. I like how definitive you are. I think that's uh, I, that's, that's a hot topic. I think I've heard people yeah, go back and forth know, on it. I know, I know. I heard that too. I'm definitely on that side. But I, I also will say that you just, you're describing ways to limit or mitigate bad research. You know, I, I think... Help, help make it better. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, first they need to know about it. Most what what happens in in I mean, there are so many people who develop, let's say, software at Goldman. They're not even aware of our existence. It's not it's not that they think about it and say, uh, no, I'm not going to do it. They they don't even know that this is happening, that we are there. So I think there's a long way to go. We need to kind of be more popular, be more known, uh, and then provide all the tools, help guidance, knowledge that we can, knowing that we can't support everybody. It's not going to happen. Happened even at Google that had, at the time, hundreds of today, probably a lot more researchers. There are teams that built stuff. <laughs> why, why not allow them to do research? should help them. I mean, you made the comment that research was happening before there were yeah. researchers. Yeah. I mean, in the history of the world, that's also yeah. true, right? It's you know, true. Okay. We can't stop that or control that. Um and so maybe just a slight shift. We're sort of talking about who's allowed to do what, yeah. uh, or what you know. What are researchers, and what do we do? You mentioned early on that uh, you also have taken on a, uh, an additional role. Yeah. You want to just give some context to that, and what does that mean um, for you? 
Yeah, I also lead a design group for for a product, private wealth management, allows very rich people to manage their money. Uh, it's a part of a service Goldman, that Goldman offers. And the digital aspect of it is not the primary aspect of it. It's just a, has a kind of supporting role. It's mostly based on a, rela- a relationship between an advisor, Goldman Sachs advisor and a, a client. And, um, and there's, you know, the, the usual suspects as website, apps, and so on. So um, I'm now kind of leading a group of people that um, design that. Um, and I mean design kind of with the expanded uh, way we define it. So it's not just designers, it's also researchers and data people and a writer and prototyping and so on. Are there differences between managing researchers, you talked before about people coming in with resumes that scream researchers uh, versus, you know, all the different kinds of functions you're working with on that team? Uh, honestly, no, I don't think so. I, I would be the first to admit it. I'm not, I'm not personally, not the best designer, not in the world, definitely, and, and not that I could be. But I think there are things that are similar, no matter what kind of group you're you're leading. It's good that you know something about what your what the group is doing, yeah. but I think it's mostly about kind of empowering the right people, giving them what they need, releasing them of things that are just stupid that they don't need to do, they don't need to be involved in, and focusing them them on what they are passionate about. This doesn't, you know, have any direct relationship with design or research or yeah or there's um there's an email list that I think you and I are both on that's about design and user research mm-hmm. um, and there was a thread or maybe people were having a conference call I can't even remember how, how it manifested but uh, the topic was uh, researchers managing designers okay this sort of which seems like it's a newer thing that if you look historically like research was sort of the the sort of accessory or yep. adjacency to design and so design teams kind of manage researchers yes but as researchers grown you know that there's other people in the situation like yours yeah. where their label for themselves would lean more towards researcher, right. but they're managing designers. So it's interesting that you sort of don't see a difference because I feel like the thrust of this group needing to talk was, hey, there's something different here. And so how are we going to deal with it? I, I know I have kind of my internal bias towards research. So I'm probably more kind of attentive to mostly when that is not happening, maybe than a person who would be a designer that manages designers, but I'm just guessing. I don't know. I know that I'm definitely going to, I care about research and I, and I notice and say something when it doesn't happen. Mm. So I don't know. I would have to be a designer of designers to know if, if, if that's different. <laughs> <laughs> I think it might switch gears entirely here. Go for um, it. I'd love to just go way back, like as far uh-huh. back as you want to go okay. and maybe, you know, give the story of Thing, you know, things you did in your life to kind of get here, whether those are work or school or other things, like what's the... That got me here? Yeah, what's your, what's your sort of background or your, your narrative arc, if you will? So I'll tell you something from a long time ago that probably really was the, the, the tipping point that I wasn't even aware of that that was the, the tipping point at the time. So, uh, I mean, it's not a secret. I'm originally from Israel and I relocated oh, almost 12 years ago. And while in Israel, I, was, I served in the army. And um, I signed for kind of career in the army. So the whole shebang to be a kind of career officer for the long term. But then when I was, let's see, 24, I, uh, I was a paraglider and I, I took a course and I got injured badly. And I was out of the army for a year. I was at home kind of recovering. And uh, that was a bad thing. <laughs> Bad, bad injury, but that opened my eyes. And during that year, I came back to the army and said, I want to cancel the whole thing. I don't want to stay. I want out. I will do my next job because we planned for one more job, but that's it. I'm out. And that's what happened. And um, I think without that accident, <laughs> I would probably, uh, I'd probably be retired by now, but, <laughs> but I would be a career officer and not what I am today. And kind of looking back, I'm happy that that's what happened. That was kind of, I would say that's the biggest uh, thing that affected what I'm doing today. And so the, you know, opening your eyes was realizing that you didn't want to go on the path that you were on. Was there any 
hints for you of what path you did want to pursue? I knew it was uh, creative. Uh, I was I was on a wheelchair for four months and then crunches and then learned how to walk again. And uh, I uh, kind of made my way uh, once I was able to kind of get up uh, to a local artist that uh, gave kind of very open-ended lessons uh, in his basement. Um, like a couple of blocks from my my house at the time. And uh, so I started painting and uh, kind of tried all kinds of uh, ways to paint. And I, I knew I didn't know I didn't know to say that I will be an artist. And honestly, I wasn't really good at it, but um, I, I, I knew it would it would be something. Creative. So I didn't know exactly. I didn't know exactly what. And if you look at your work today, does it does it match that? Um, not a hundred percent overlap, but I feel some of it is. Yeah. I mean, I have wrestled mostly privately with just the idea: is research a creative field, or are we creative? Some of it is. Some of it is. I found myself in a in a collaboration with people that I think more traditionally fit that job description, and uh, I kind of had my hair blown back just on sort of the the speed of sort of yeah. the speed and breadth of making stuff. It was it was definitely intimidating, and I had to think, yeah. well, you know. So I would call myself a researcher, but still, I I kind of I was heavily involved in shaping Polaris. That's not a that's a product. That's not yeah. you know, research work. I'm now involved in creating a system that I lead a, I also lead a small team of engineers that build a system uh, to measure the user experience. So that that is definitely more mm. creative than maybe research, but some parts of, of kind of pure research are are creative, deciding kind of to me the probably the biggest one is uh, translating a, a one or a set of, of questions that a team has into okay, what are we gonna do to get answers? Mm. It's not always, if, if it was that easy to come up with an answer to that, then anybody would do that well. But that's not the case. A lot of people are having a lot of trouble uh, with that part. So I think that's a creative part. You're not going to see a beautiful painting coming out of right. that, but it is, it, is, uh, it is creative. I think the, I mean, for me, the creating the new story out of a yeah. bunch of experiences or nuggets or whatever sort of you're pulling from. Realizing, kind of getting to an insight. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you do after the art class? What did you uh, end up doing? Um, I applied to uh, what we call today probably a visual communication uh, program. I got accepted to one of the best ones, if not the best ones in Israel at the time, and last minute decided that it's not for me. And then I learned, I studied uh, copywriting. So I'm a certified copywriter. Uh, in Hebrew, though, and um, and then I took my first job, or I I worked. I worked for three years as you know. I didn't really know what I was going to do, so I did something that I knew how to do, and that was I worked in a very small uh, consultancy for military-oriented industries. So I did that for. I was a project manager. I did that for I think three years. And that was the time where I kind of learned all these things and, and kind of really set my mind that, you know, anything army related is not for me. And then uh, my first, my first real job in that direction was, I was a, <laughs> funny how names were at the time, I was an internet copywriter, mm. we probably call today a content strategist for a website that I would compare it to a uh, Monster or Indeed or something like that uh, today. And there I got exposed to, uh, probably at the time it was Jacob Nielsen and, 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 and people in that area started reading more. Uh, I did some, what again, what we would call today product management work there. And then uh, I asked them to switch to what we would call today a researcher. They said no. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Uh, and I looked for a company who would take me. Uh, and there was one company that took me as a, again, it wasn't a researcher. It was called uh, Usability something. And that's it. That's how it started. They were very brave, I should admit, uh, because I didn't know much. <laughs> but they took you as a researcher. Yeah. So that was sort of your first yeah. time with the title. Yeah. Yeah. You want more funny, uh, even funnier story? There was, the only person who actually knew what it was was the CEO. He was the one who interviewed me. And then he hired me. And then a month later, he decided to leave. So the only person who really knew what I was doing left about a month in. So, uh, but that went well. But 
yeah, that's how it started. <laughs> and what uh, what was the point at which you came to the U.S.? Um, so I had, I think, uh, one more or a couple more jobs, and I realized very quickly that at the time, at least, there weren't enough or even at all uh, opportunities to grow into even managing a group or a team of people who do that. I was always the only person in the company that did that. And I, I realized or I, I got to the conclusion that the only place for me to work in a company that has a, kind of a lot of people of my tribe would be here in the States. And I also realized the army there is not like the army here. I didn't have any academic degree. I also realized that I needed the, the right degree uh, because these companies that I was thinking about would not even read my resume. My resume didn't scream researcher. Mm -hmm. um, so... Uh, so I went to school. Um, I continued working and went to school, completed my bachelor's, and then applied to Bentley University here and then moved. And as I was studying there, I, uh, yeah, during school there uh, in Massachusetts, I, I uh, contacted Google and, and uh, things rolled from there. We talked about WeWork a little bit. Yep. What was your role at Google and maybe what was your role at WeWork? Uh, Google, I was a, a user researcher, a senior re user researcher, first in uh, advertising. Uh, I'm pretty sure they changed all the names by now. But uh, at the time, it was uh, Double Click for Publishers. That was the product I was involved in. Uh, ironically, I was the only researcher uh, there in that group of mm -hmm. hundreds of people. And after, I think, two and a half years, I switched to uh, transfer to search. And in search, I was uh, first uh, voice search. And then we called it at the time core search of the bag of 10 blue links and how they developed from that point what you see today as kind of all the, the visual aspects of the results and so on so that started back then uh vertical by vertical tv movies music i was doing a lot of research into search results for sports know a lot more than i should about all kinds of sports <laughs> cricket and mm. so on mm -hmm. uh yeah that that was uh and then the, what was, was the it. role you took at we work we work as head of user experience um so I started a group from scratch and the goal there um and this is kind of following several conversations with the ceo and co-founder that that hired me at the time again i'm sure things have changed since but at the time uh we work had three big groups internally that kind of built or created the three aspects of the WeWork product. And they were called even digital, uh, physical, and community. And Adam, the, the CEO, felt, and he was very right, that while each group is doing a great job, sometimes if you look, kind of think or look for how things are from the perspective of the customer, the member, uh, there are gaps between those groups. Uh, that we're not even aware of. And the goal was to identify those gaps. To me, that translates to research. And then solve the problems there. I'm thinking of an example. Think about conference rooms. So conference rooms is something that uh, WeWork offers. Members pay for it. So somebody designed, physically designed the conference room, an architect decided on the size and location, uh, an interior designer decided on the mood and, and what will be in the room. Somebody from IT picked an AV system for that room. Somebody in digital developed a system to book this room. Uh, somebody in community designed a policy of how to use this room and um, community uh, team members in the buildings enforce this policy. Everything's good, everything's working well, but then situations happen such as, you know, members come to a meeting, they book book their room, and then another member is squatting uh, the room and refusing to, to go out. Even if they walk in, they realize that I'm a startup, I, ha I booked a room for a meeting with a potential investor, and then I see a room that is designed as a music room with bean bags and it's clear and no projector clearly inappropriate for my meeting or that person who's squatting I'm going to the community manager but they are dealing with a leak of water from the ceiling on one another member's head so they're all very nice but they can't solve my problem right now so this is what I talk what I'm talking about when I said the gap between kind of mm. those those groups so we're trying to identify those those gaps because in many cases we didn't even we were, didn't even know about about this and uh and try and solve them so great that was the the premise uh, okay back then is there any um you've written books you give a lot yeah. of talks what Le would you less now less I now i should say you, yeah you have a good sort of history of, yeah. of creating used, material yeah. you've interviewed a lot of people yeah um 
what would you, people listening, what would you send them to, to buy, read, watch? Well, our publisher would not uh, be a publisher if he wouldn't be happy if I say that they should buy our, uh, my book, yours too. Um, and that would be, uh, the name of the book is Validating Product Ideas Through Lean User Research. That's a book for, I would, I would only mention that because my first book is for uh, researchers, you know what, a lot of researchers do listen, right? So maybe I'll mention both. But uh, the second book, the one I mentioned is uh, for, is it's kind of step-by-step guide into answering different research questions uh, that people have. Each chapter is a research question, step-by-step on how to answer it through uh, research that anybody can do uh, quickly. The first book, um, it's called uh, uh, It's Our Research. Uh, it's to solve a problem that at least at the time, I now have different thoughts about that, but uh, at least at the time, uh, a lot of researchers uh, had maybe today as well. And that is a problem that a lot of people don't want to do research because they feel they have the answers already or they have good intuition. And also once uh, they agree to do research, in some cases, they don't want to act on it. Mm. Wait, um, act on on the research what, what they've learned yeah yes yeah so that's a book that that uh supposed to help uh with that problem and i'm kind of having different thoughts now because my answer uh in that book was and that's why i called it it's our research make them feel that it's their research as much as you feel it's yours and then they would want it and then they would do something about it that was my point today i'm having kind of different thoughts about how to uh get to a point where research is wanted and and acted on and i will try it at some point we just need to grow a little bit at, at, at goldman but my thoughts are you know when you uh and i posted something uh, about that recently when you plug your phone charger to the wall. Do you really care how electricity gets there? What's happening in the power plant? Why it's working? How is it efficient? Is it not efficient? And so on. You don't really care. You want your phone charged. My thoughts about research is why wouldn't be the same? People have questions. Research provides answers. Yes, a lot is going on to get to those answers. But if you have a question Why do we need to bother you with all the details? Let's just do the thing. Trust us to do the thing. We'll give you an answer to your question. Uh, I'm going to try that at some point. Um, I'm thinking of kind of, it's not political, but uh, building a wall between uh, stakeholders and researchers. Mm -hmm. That wall could be Slack or, or something like that, through which stakeholders ask questions and researchers provide answers. If we have an answer immediately, if we have a system like Polaris or something like that, we can provide an answer. If we don't, we, we will just you know ask a few questions, follow-up questions, and then do the research and get the answer. Just thoughts. I haven't tried it yet. What makes me think of the research ops piece a little bit where like building up participant recruitment infrastructure yeah. Yeah. is an interesting one because you know back in the old days where we had to, you know, do everything ourselves, you're learning about your problem by recruiting. figuring out how to recruit, by yeah. recruiting. Uh, you also learn about your problem by dealing with your stakeholder and seeing what, it's that art piece versus this kind of yeah. process infrastructure piece. And it's interesting to think about uh, like what is lost and what is gained or how is it changed yeah. when you create infrastructure that, like if you're a researcher and you're completely decoupled from participant recruiting, that may change how you deal with the people that you meet or how you deal with framing the problem. Yeah. And so for everything that we build up a process that's efficiency, that kind of is a, a, you know, a query system, how does that change what we do and, and who's coming to this field? And yeah. these are not necessarily my own thoughts, yeah, but yeah. just things I'm hearing from people as well. One other thing that I would send people to is yeah. a series of, uh, of uh, Medium posts that I published in the past year, maybe less, about measuring uh, the user experience. A lot of people like to talk about metrics these days. Uh, I took the heart uh, framework from Google and then we have a post per letter. So about happiness, engagement, adoption, retention, and task success. And for each one, what it is, what's important to measure, why, how, mistakes, and what actions you can take uh, from each one. So this is something that I'm kind of I'm interested in these days measurements and I'm kind of trying to figure out the H part, the happiness part specifically. There are a ton of challenges with that, how to measure satisfaction and happiness. And um, yeah, I'm also posting kind of tracking my, not tracking my own life, but 
paying more attention to when I'm exposed to uh, requests to rate satisfaction mm. and happiness, and I share them um, with people with with my kind of thoughts about them. Okay. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Anything else that we should talk about in this conversation? I said I am uh, speaking kind of publicly a lot less, but I do do that from time to time. I'll be speaking in two conferences, the Face of Finance in April, I think, uh, in New York and uh, in London, User Research London in June in London. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks That's for it. taking the time to chat sure and sharing all the information and stories and everything. That's really, Thank you. really that appreciate was fun. it. Thank you. Thanks. And so concludes another episode of Dollars to Donuts. Follow the podcast on Twitter and subscribe to the podcast at portable.com slash podcast or iTunes or Spotify or Stitcher or any place you get your podcasts. Also online at portable.com slash podcast is the transcript and links for this episode and of course all the previous episodes. At Amazon and RosenfeldMedia.com, you can buy Tomer's books and my books. Our rocking theme music was written and performed by Bruce Todd.